uh, you all here and also having hopefully a few colleagues joining us on the web. Uh, this spring I had a, a possibility to attend a very interesting conference called Royal Colloquium, which is a, a three-day conference uh, initiated actually 25 years ago, I think, by the Swedish king to gather a number of scientists and other people, I'm, I'm in that category, uh, to a three-day discussion on major topics, things going on in the world, you know, interesting perspectives of development and environment and so on. Uh, this uh, meeting in May uh, was potentially his last one. We'll see what happens there. Uh, a nice group of people, about 25 people gathering just outside of Stockholm to discuss really a lot of different perspectives, I would say, about global development, environment issues, looking ahead. I had then the opportunity to listen to a lot of interesting speeches and Per Espen Storknes that uh, is joining us today. He gave a short presentation, at least partly related to uh, the book uh, that you see on the left-hand side, which I found really, really mind-boggling and interesting about climate psychology. And this very interesting topic, you know, what, how do we avoid thinking about things um, that we find difficult? Uh, this is a quite common problem among all of us, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But you have made quite a lot of analysis behind this and what, you know, what are the drivers in our brain and the way we, we are looking at uh, challenges in the world to really, and which can also be very critical to understand policy making. How do you actually effectively try to influence policy processes and so on? What do you need to, what are the barriers that you really need to look at? So I asked um, Per Espen that if he would be in Stockholm at some point, if he could join us here and present uh, his work. Um, and gladly, already now, today in August, we had the opportunity to welcome you here to Stockholm. So Per Espen, the, the floor is yours, please. Thanks, Johan, your warm words. Um, so, um, being both an economist and a psychologist, um, I tend to come to climate and climate uh, policies from a different angle than, uh, than most. And um, the question that's been driving me is uh, this one, over the last, my, driving my research over the last decades, uh, is that are human beings inevitably short term? Is it the case that we are, so to speak, hardwired in our psychology and brain to bring down the ecosphere, the biosphere, with us? Um, or could we flip the question over, as I've done in my research, and ask, if we're not inevitably short term, what then are the conditions under which humans will act for the long term, particularly when it comes to climate? Because, you know, climate change has been framed as a wicked problem, very difficult thing, but as economists know, it's quite simple, really. You solve the climate problem by doing two things. You you slap a proper price on carbon, and then you use some of the proceeds to educate women, particularly in developing countries, and you can even distribute the, the rest back as a reduction in income tax or distribute it back to people. So, of course, the question becomes, why don't we do it? So, in order to get to that, I've um, done quite a bit of research. Why is it that humans do not take the brilliant rational advice that economists uh, have made for us, uh, why don't we just implement it? And part of the reason is in the way climate is being communicated to people in public. Um, being here at SEI, I don't have to explain this graph. Uh, this is from IPCC AR5. It shows two main developments that have been discussed and repeated over the last 25 years. One is a business as usual trajectory to 2100, which um, is deeply troublesome with a four degrees global average increase. And in really to get the dramatic impact of that across, IPCC managed to give this scenario with the name of RCP 8.5. Now, does that evoke inspiration? And there's a good scenario as well, which, which goes back, keeps it below two degrees. And to get the hopefulness across, they gave it the incredibly communicative name of RCP 2.6 as if that would get people on board. Or, but the real fact may, might be more like a big yawn. So I've been studying the effect on the public over the last 25 years of this kind of 
climate science communication. And the effect you can see here on the Norwegian public, um, we have good timeline series going back to 1989. The question is, how concerned are you for greenhouse effects and climate change? It's being uh, asked to about four or 5,000 Norwegians every year, every, so every second year, all the way from 89 to 2015. And you can look here, as the amount of climate science goes up, the amount of worry, very worried, or some worry, goes down. So it seems the more science backing you have, the less people care. What about the US? Not exactly the same question, but almost the same. How much do you personally worry about the greenhouse effect, the global warming? Start about in the same area, six to seven out of 10, and it's been mostly sinking over the time. It just recently turned up a little bit now in the US in this March, which uh, with a result that surprised me, and I hope this will continue. Maybe we're seeing some turning effect. What about Sweden? Um, I haven't found good data because, unfortunately, climate psychology research hasn't been standardized, but there is something called the WSP group that has done this in 2008, and they ask, are you climate conscious? And Swedish, klima medveten. And we have the same result here, 2008, more than 90%, now it's going down to below uh, 80 over the last seven years. So. Internationally, we see the, uh, another interesting comparison between the psychology of the cultures between globally, where 46% is very concerned, which means on the one hand, climate communicators is a big success. 46% of the global population say that climate change is the most, um, is very concerned about that threat. While in the US, you have the opposite. Islamic extremism is more worrisome, and then international instability, and then climate change. The same thing is with the EU, except that climate change beat international financial instability with a little bit. But in the Asia and Latin America, climate is the most important problem. Should we take questions as long as we go, or shall we do it at the end? If you have a quick question, why not? Yeah, please. How is the question framed regarding time perspective? If you ask people about how concerned are you in the coming years, you might get one also. How concerned are you in the coming 50 years? You might get one also. Exactly. So, there are good reasons, good, thank you for a uh, good suggestion to improve the quality of this, and the time perspective has not been specified. So, they're on the same timeline here. Um, and also, if you ask, are humans responsible? This is international responses to the question the climate change we're currently seeing is largely the result of human activity. Do you agree or do you disagree? And in China, Argentina, Italy, Spain, southern countries mainly, all of that agree. But at the bottom here you find countries such as Australia, Great Britain, and the US, where a lot of people disagree. So from this research, there seems to be some kind of weird correlation between speaking English and doubting climate science. Um, so if you do the OECD countries and you ask uh, what the public think, do climate scientists such as you agree or do you disagree on the climate change problem? And most people, about half think that climate scientists agree. Well, as you all know, in reality, it's a very strong consensus, depending, of course, exactly how you measure that, which is a difficult issue. But the main point is this, what I call the psychological climate paradox. How can it be that over the last 25 years, with the more climate science, higher degree of certainty, more dramatic outcomes, concern of people actually go down. This is very contrary to what a rational scientist would expect. That the more certain the science, and the more urgent, then you would expect the concern to go up, not down. And why does it happen only in richer Western democracies while it doesn't happen in countries such as Latin America, Asia, and parts of Africa. This is a question that climate communicators, particularly in the Western countries, need to take into account. So, in order to get good answers to this, and I'm happy to discuss these, what I did was to review about three, four hundred articles from psychology, sociology, social anthropology, some behavioral economics, and then to see how, what are the main barriers, the main defenses that people use to keep the climate science outside their heart, so to speak. It doesn't, do not take it in. And then secondly, what are the main solutions? What are the evidence-based solutions that we actually know work from 
repeated, validated studies. And this is have summarized in this book what we think about when we try not to think about global warming. And now I'm going to give you an incredibly condensed version of these three, 400 articles, uh, boiling down to about the next 20 minutes. So I wrapped it up in this illustration. Let's say you have a climate message such as this one. This July 2016 was the 15th consecutive warmest month ever measured in, hu uh, in human history. Does that climate message go come through and change people's heart? Or if it doesn't, why don't it? So the five barriers that are, it's more like, it's like consecutive circles around a fort. These are the defenses of the self against climate messages. And I've synthesized the research into five main barriers and giving them all names on D in order to be easy to remember. It's the distance barrier, the doom barrier, the distance, dissonance barrier, the denial barrier, and the identity barrier. So I'll very rapidly walk you through them and then we can dip in wherever you want. First, the distance one. Climate messengers are happy to speak about 2050 or 2100, which is very difficult from an ordinary people's life where their, their attention is mostly on the next weeks, maybe. And very few of us are able to take decisions today on behalf of the next century, unless we are assisted to do so. Secondly, climate communicators conventionally use images of glaciers, of polar bears, of penguins and storms, and these things are all far away from people. So what you are inadvertently communicating is that climate change is far away, in addition to time, also in space. Thirdly, when we hear about the people who suffer from climate change, there's typically big storms or floodings and they live somewhere else. Uh, it's always just a minority and I don't know these people, I don't know anybody who knows them. And when I hear a statistic such as there's been a million people lost, losing their homes, that's, as you know, is statistics. It's not something personal. So the more distance there is between this, those who suffer and the one who is receiving the message, the less empathy. It's a well-known psychological phenomenon of social distance. Fourth, responsibility. Climate change has been communicated as a technical issue in terms of global policies, and we have an endless series of COPs, um, wishy-washy Warsaw, etc. Finally, something better in Paris. But the by effect here is that people here, this is something outside my scope of influence. I don't know these people. I don't have any access to them. It's the top guys, big guys speaking, their problem, not mine. So combined, time, space, social and responsibility make up what we call psychological distancing, which lowers the feeling of personal risk and reduces the sense of urgency, resulting in low issue priority. So when you measure which are the main concerns for people in Sweden, in Norway, and USA, if you have a list of 10, 15 topics, climate change tends to come far down on this list. So it doesn't reach up on the top political concern of the uh, politicians' gallops. That was distance. What about doom? Uh, let's say you say that, you know, climate change is here, it's now, it's impacting our lives, our health, we need to do something about it right now, or else, dot, dot, dot. What people hear is that you're bringing up catastrophe and doomsday, and we have that deep in our Christian cultures. We have 2,000 years of apocalypse thinking and the end times. So psychologically, what is brought up is to hear that if you don't change, you're going to hell. And Magazines have been selling this story for quite some time. Um, and for some time it sold well. Be wary, be very wary. And here we have again the proverbial polar bear. Um, but what we do know from psychology, if, that you, if you overuse the doom, you, you get apocalypse fatigue. You no longer create engagement, but there is this kind of fear or guilt, vague thing. And then I move on. I go from habituation to avoidance. So I start to think about something else. I change the channel. I let's say to people, well, uh, I, you know, I can't just handle that today. Um, and then finally, you end up in stereotyping the messengers. So environmentalists such as SEI sometimes get this projection back from stereotypes saying that you guys, you environmentalists, you say people are bad. You know, so it's more like save the planet, go kill yourself. Humans are a pest, a virus on this earth. So, you know, doomsday prophets, I've had enough of them. That's 
the defense mechanism, you awake by overusing the doomsday uh, framing. And over 80% of news media articles have been employing the catastrophe framing according to research by Oxford Institute of Journalism. 80% catastrophe. So we've overused people's capacity to engage through the doomsday frame. What about dissonance, the next barrier? Well, that has to do with if you see yourself as a good guy, an environmentalist, something, but then you drive car, you eat meat, you, you, fl you fly a plane, all these kind of things, they, you know, and then it's just not me, it's also my friends, my colleagues, they fly, and the politicians. So if everybody does the same, you know, it can't be really that serious. We find ways to rethink this. And um, some um, students I met in um, San Francisco wanted to make this um, film version of the book, so they made this just to illustrate. That's when it hit me. I had just gone home from dropping Preston at test prep to find my neighbor starting an eco remodel. They told me that my house was polluting 500 tons of carbon a year. Disgusting. That's when it hit me. I was in my cruiser going to Whole Foods to get some snacks for me and my bros. I rolled up to my favorite spot right in front, and that's when it hit me. I had cognitive dissonance. lives that contradict what we know. That's the problem with cognitive dissonance. And we know that very well from psychology. Our brains then get quite creative and um, we start to come up with excuses such as, you know, my emissions are really quite small. My neighbor has a bigger SUV than me. Or Swedes would say maybe, you know, the Swedish emissions are right. It's the Norwegian emissions. They are too big. Or the Norwegians would say, it's not the Norwegian emissions, we are so few, it's the USA. And the USA would say, it's not the US emissions, it's the Chinese emissions, they are the problem. So you find ways to kind of work yourself out of that, to reduce your dissonance that arises from having high emissions and leading to climate chaos. Then I can also, you know, there are also a lot of misinformation campaigns out there, well-oiled, well-funded, saying that climate change is natural, CO2 is good, this climate change is always changed, it's the sun. And if I start to believe that, then my dissonance goes away. So, yes, there is a supply of misinformation in, um, uh, messages, but why do people want to buy it? And cognitive dissonance explains that. It's a demand side of doubt. If I doubt the science, I feel better immediately because my dissonance goes away. If dissonance goes along for too long, then you end up in denying hated. And Denial has been an overused word in climate co uh, communication and policy, and it's always the other guys who are deniers. So you get this polarizing effect. So, but in psychology, denier is not um, just somebody stupid, ignorant, or immoral. It is the capacity we all have to actually live a life as if we do not know what we know. It's called a double life. I can know people are suffering. I can know the neighborhood girl is being molested. I know her father's an alcoholist, but I live as if I do not know, because if I tell everybody, hell breaks loose. So in a way, it becomes a social contract. And the maintenance of this social contract, such as done by this man or by Ted Cruz or others, is a way to kind of keep legitimizing that this is an issue in our culture we're not supposed to take seriously. So denial is a, both a psychological and a sociological state of mind in which we live, we, we agree to live as if we don't know what we do know. So it's an inner barrier we have that I do know, but I live as if I don't. And then managing that tension by suppressing it. That's the psychological dynamics of denial that Sigmund Freud originally uncovered, and it's been repeated by lots of empirical studies, such as by Karim Marie Nurgor's book, Living in Denial, where she studied a community on the west coast of Norway. Finally, identity. How can identity be a psychological barrier against climate communication? Well, first, the um, best way to explain identity is by using cars. The car industry understood a long time ago that they don't sell cars. They sell an identity. So, which is your car? Is that you or is this you? 
I don't, I'm, relax, I'm not going to do a hands up. <laughs> but what happens if this kind of person meets this kind of person and you try to talk climate? Well, actually, I found this incredibly funny illustration of this uploaded on the internet because there's a new product out in the US to help this identity conflict. It's called Rolling Coal. And it's a kit where if you have a proper car, you know, like, and then comes this stupid, ugly Prius things up in your ass and it's pushing you, annoying you. It's quite annoying, isn't it? And then luckily I have a Prius repellent installed. You know, a Prius repellent, you know. So if I hit the button, I inject diesel into the engine so that a huge cloud of soot, rolling coal comes out. Now listen. We got him. That's a good one. So this is where climate communication gets ugly. Because you're no longer discussing a scientific topic, you're discussing my identity and people criticizing who I am. And this shifts the whole discussion over into an area where science has very little to see, say about the topic, but it's about uh, defending my values. So for instance, Dan Kahane from Yale did this study where he gave a few thousand people this fixed choice option. Is the earth getting warmer, A, mostly because of human activity, such from burning fossil fuels, or B, because of natural variations in the Earth's environment, such as the sun. And the more science intelligence you have, the more PhD, postdoc, whatever, you're up here. And if you have no academic education, you're down here. And then this is a probability of getting it right. So the more education I have, on average, I get it more right, or people get it more right. But there is a lot of standard deviation in the ends of this. So how can this be? So he split this according to identity, meaning individual, uh, individualistic values, conservative values, or liberal or egalitarian values. And the interesting thing is, if you have liberal in, uh, egalitarian values, you very quickly get it more right with the more education you have. But if it's the other way around, if climate scientists say that we need more tax, more regulation, bigger government, and I don't really like that, these things kind of threaten my identity, then I've learned to use my science and knowledge to explain it all away. So the more education I have, the more wrong I get it on this question. So this is how identity overrides facts. It's called the confirmation bias in psychology. It's very found foundational to defending who I am in the world. So to sum this up in uh, five barriers. Conventional climate communication creates distance between the audience and the crisis. There is dissonance between how we feel about climate change and how we behave in everyday life. To get rid of blame and guilt, we sometimes deny there's even a problem. And lastly, our limited sense of self-identity has made climate change a political issue when it's actually not. So that was 300 articles condensed into 22 seconds, <laughs> at least according to him. So how do we break through these barriers or, or maybe just go around them? Because I don't really think you can knock barriers down. Um, and what, sorry guys, uh, if you're into producing reports, uh, I'm going to disappoint you because people don't have uh, a lack of information. The information deficit idea that people, if only people knew the facts, they would agree with us scientists and us experts. That just isn't so. Rather, we need a new climate communication toolbox that goes along with the human nature, goes along with the way our brain is configured. And the literature shows that there are main five strategies or solutions, all starting on S, we can employ. The first is rather than making climate distant, we must make it social. So please stop using polar bears, stop using glaciers, and use people's faces instead because that makes it feel much nearer. Then use of social norms, social media, make it local and have some fun glow and flow into it. So like one community in Bergen in Oslo, Bergen, uh, so, uh, they, they started a new motto from protest to party or better in Norwegian, from protest till fest. <laughs> So they make each climate action a party. So they throw artists and they have music and they have, you know, do it. And also 
we know that if you put solar panels on one roof, the likelihood of these roofs also getting solar panel is much higher than the average of the country they're in. So rooftop solar, electric bikes, electric cars, these things have so, uh, are kind of socially contagious. Um, famous study done by Bob Cialdini and his team, which resulted in the foundation of something called O-Power, you might have heard of. They did is that they took four household categories, a few thousand households, and tested, can you put power consumption at home for the sake of sustainability and the earth? That was the first group. The second group were told, please cut power consumption for the sake of future generations, your children, your grandchildren. Third group were asked, please cut because it's profitable. If you cut your power bill, Sorry, if you cut your power consumption, you cut your power bill. It's good for your wallet. And fourth, we're told how much they use compared to their neighbors. Absolutely. Consistently on a long series of studies. So now this has been translated into um, a business model. You give people feedback like this. This is you. This is efficient neighbors. This is all neighbors. And I get two smileys because I'm better than the efficient neighbors. If I'm below average, I don't get any frowns because... If I get this, what do I say? I say, oh, bugger off, that's a stupid thing. So people don't just want to conserve energy, they want to be acknowledged for conserving energy. That's the thing. And of course, you can use new messengers, such as sports people, neighbors. You can have Stockholm versus Gothenburg. You can have Texas versus California competing. And Green Sports Alliance is doing this because they're green in the sports alliance and they reach a complete new set of audience. It's not just an egghead speaking, but it is somebody I admire, I want to be like. That's the changing of the messengers that grows out of this. Why is it so important to do this? Because it breaks the barrier of distance. The more social it is, the less distant people experience it. That is how we avoid triggering the distance barrier. Second, uh, nudging like uh, the work you're already involved in with the EAT and uh, the green nudge. Um, if you just change the size of the plate at a buffet in a restaurant, from this big one to this one, this one looks full, this one looks empty, I put more food on this one. So changing this plate to this plate reduces 20% uh, of food waste. And as all of you know how much energy goes into making food, 20% of food waste from the hotel is, is a big thing. And you just do it by something simple like this. Also, you could change um, the, the labeling of household appliances from showing the sales price to the life cycle price, the life cycle cost. So I could see when I go in there, not the price just today, but I see the price for seven years. I can also find the price for today, but that should be in smaller fonts. And the big fonts should be the life cycle cost. This is called salience in behavioral economics. If you make the life cycle cost salient while the purchasing price is less, then you shift people's behavior and you can cut up to 10 million tons of CO2 just by redesigning the price label on household appliances in the EU. That's the, that's the outcomes of these studies. I'll, I'll skip the video. My final one has to do with the power of defaults. Um, how many people do you think actually buy carbon offsets for their plane travel? It's one, less than 1%. What do you say? Yeah. It's really 3%, around 2 to 3%. 2 to 3%? Okay. The yeah. Those are all here. <laughs> yeah, in this room, yeah? Okay. But what happened if you shifted the default? So you had to actively, after going through all these, all these pages, um, and then rather than clicking and then doing an extra step to make a CO2 offset purchase, it was automatically included. And that what I did was to manipulate this a little bit. You can't see it, but that's part of the point. With small fonts, it says here, check here to not pay carbon credits. <laughs> By flipping the default over, you have a huge behavioral effect. We know that from a lot of studies. So these are three examples of how we can uh, shift towards more simple actions. And this counters the dissonance. You don't feel dissonant any longer if you have more climate-friendly behaviors. Next major lesson for climate communication is to use more supportive framings. Um, as I said, more than 80% catastrophe framing and less than 5% opportunity framing in um, the studies from the news media. We need to shift that around um, from a political discussion of how costly it is and it's job killing to a discussion where we speak about people's health. We do know that the more you make climate a health issue, the more the general public involves. 
I can speak a lot about that, but we have sort of time, so I'll just go on. The second is insurance issue. We pay about 3% of our insurance for fire and theft insurance. Why do we do that? Do we, do we believe our house will burn down? No. But it's good to have. And we should reposition the climate policies as climate insurance. And this has been done well started by a risky business report where they say it's time to take out a climate insurance policy of our own. We follow the same logic as with fire insurance. Um, if we say 3% in fire insurance, why can't we increase to 1% in terms of climate policy uh, insurance? Thirdly, in addition to health and insurance framing, we do know that the opportunity framing works. And it's probably the most psychologically effective to creating engagement. So if you want to create climate engagement, speak at least 75% about opportunity. Um, I like this example, solar roadways. You might have heard of it, maybe not. What they do is to replace asphalt with solar cells underneath a level of hardened glass. So the, smart, the road, we have smartphones, we have smart houses, why can't we have smart roads that make more energy than the car needs to run on it? And if you ask an economist, I'm sure there are economists here, they will say, oh, too expensive, too costly. Do we say too expensive? Well, forget it, it's costly. And they said that. Yet people love the opportunity. So they crowdfunded this on Indiegogo and they got four times as much money as they asked for. People were throwing money at them because they love the opportunity. And that's the psychological effect you need to visualize what kind of future we really want. So uh, this is one of the most successful crowdfundings in history. And of course, Tesla is another company that's giving people the opportunity of freedom energy. It's not about battery, it's about getting out of the monopolistic suppression of utilities. It's having your own car powered by your own sun, with your own house energy. People love that independence, freedom story or opportunity around it. And of course, Google is buying Nest to get inside the Internet of Things, and all the opportunities of smart housing, and the Chinese are skipping road traffic, trying to reduce it a little by selling 50 million electric bikes per year now. So these are different types of opportunities that show a different type of future. And they are psychologically much more effective to bring engagement than the catastrophe framing. Together, this comes into the story of where we want to go. You see, the main problem today isn't that people don't think climate change is real, because they do. 63% uh, of the people think it's real, only 18% say no. 52% say it's human cost, 52% say it's worried, but 44% half and half say it's nothing much to worry about. But what about solvable? If you ask people, will humanity solve the climate problem in this century, more or less? And people say, we're fucked. <laughs> and this is because we don't have any credible story of how we turn society around. And that's the story we need to create a narrative that people find plausible, credible, and we want to be part of it. We need to create that wish in the human heart to go on. And one guy who knew to do that was this guy. It was terrible. He was persecuted, you know, surveillance, suppression, poor. But he didn't sell, talk about the hell. He talked about the dream. And you know what happened. So hell doesn't sell. Sorry, guys, after 25 years of selling hell, we have to change our story. And, of course, a new story, as, as the AI is involved in, is that green growth is smart if we can credibly make it a real way out of this um, mess we created. And we need to point out that it's very profitable. It's more expensive to, to continue as today. It's, uh, you know, I like this way of telling it. The Stone Age didn't end because of a lack of stones. We found smarter ways of doing stuff. And, of course, petro means stone. So in the same way, petroleum age doesn't end because of a lack of oil, but because we do it in a smarter way. But if you go out too much against oil, as in Norway, where we are petroholics, I get all the, the you know, resistance and people criticizing me. So what I have to say is, thank you, oil. It's been good. We've been a blessing together, but times are changing. It's like a dysfunctional marriage. We've been together too long now. So it's time to, to go. Our paths... Um, it just doesn't work any longer. Time to go.
time to shift. And the new story has to be a thousand different credible versions of localized where we take cities and change them into high quality of life cities with lower ecological footprint. And this is what makes it credible. We need to tell this story for each city, for each country in a way where we show and make people want to be part of it. That's the storytelling part. And finally, we need to get signals. And the big disfavor that climate scientists are doing is that they are telling people, whatever you do, it doesn't matter because PPMs in the atmosphere is going up. Did you know 400 PPMs? We're fucked. Or we have already passed more than one degree warmer world on a century global average surface temperature. But people don't understand global average surface temperature per century. It's an incredibly bad signal to be, to be discussing. What you need to shift it is to signals that people can influence. So we show the societal response more than the climate system indicators. For instance, this is a project from a Norwegian bank. If I go into my bank account statement, this is my consumption, and this is the resulting CO2 emission. So each, I can always turn it off, of course, but immediately it becomes, shows how much CO2 have I done this month compared to the previous month, if I want. That makes it personal. And all the same way we should do it for companies, and we should do it for cities, such as Copenhagen has done. This shows we're making more value added with less emissions at a rate of more than 5% per year in that period. If cities go ahead like this, we solve the climate problem before 2050. We need a 5 to 6% carbon productivity change per year from now to 2050, and it's solved. So, are humans inevitably short-term to conclude? Well, we do know that rational facts are simply insufficient to secure a lasting engagement. We also know that humans will act for the long term if there are conducive conditions for doing so. And the research shows so far that social norms, supportive frames, simple actions, stories and signals, if one or more of these are in place, then people will act for the long term. It's not a dream, it's, it's evidence there. And if you don't believe me, look at the books and the, the, and the references there. Finally, individual human actions do not solve the climate problem. I'm not saying that we're solving the climate problem by taking individual psychological action. What I do say is that this is a new way of doing climate communication that helps us build support from the bottom and up. Thank you, Yvonne. That was my 30 minutes. <clears throat> So I'm happy to discuss, and you can, we can dive in wherever you find it provocating or unbelievable or too simplistic. Uh, Pearson, thank you very much. Th hi, I'm on there. Yeah, Pearson, thank you very much. Um, and I'm just going to, yeah, hands are coming up already, so I'm not going to start. Uh, Neil, please go ahead. I'm going to run to you as well so that the webcast can hear you. Cheers, Rob. Uh, thanks very much, Pat. That was so interesting. I think there's so much that we can take away from that, um, particularly in terms of the Ds that we can um, use to structure our communication. Um, I wondered how much uh, evidence there is that guilt motivates sort of financing and support. So we talked a lot about how doom can be too much and a positive message is uh, better. And I, I Think that's really great but i wondered if there's a balance there that mm. to some extent some degree of guilt is important to maintain motivation that there might be saturation from a positive message at some point as well i'm going to take a couple more if, it, if it's all right with you okay for uh, and I'm, I'll, I'll be able to summarize for you as well. <coughs> great. hi um thank you so much um also and i here have been working on on this topic for for years now and it's great to uh, have someone here who um, summarizes our research really ni really nicely and adds more to it obviously um i just wanted to to kind of discuss with you one a very important factor that we found in our research to be most powerful in communicating which is self-efficacy yeah. though the messaging or the signaling can be easily summarized in self-efficacy yeah. and the the way it is currently used in communication is it is always usually targeted at the individual level yeah. and that is in line with neoliberal ideas of the individuals taking re is responsible for the collective etc etc but it for for us it, it does forget that there are shared responsibilities and um, so i wanted i want to discuss that because that offers a conflict for climate communicators mm. Yeah, thanks also from my side from, for a really interesting uh, presentation, which actually, as you heard, relates very much to the work we have been doing. 
Uh, I, ha- I guess I have a more general question. Um, f- uh, you know, you talked about uh, a lot about the need to kind, kind of, yeah, change the climate change communication. And I'm wondering what you think the role of scientists is here, since after all, we, I mean, it's not really part of the incentive system for like academics to go beyond there, you know, writing up papers and reporting and so on, or going to conferences, usually conferences that are for, you know, the science communities. What do you think is the role of, of scientists here? Mm. Thanks. Super questions. Um, so first of all, yeah, yeah, the, the point about um, guilt and at what point it flips from being something that's motivating to be something that's demotivating. And actually, whether it, I, I also interpreted a little bit there that you're talking about are there particular circumstances or particular actions that actually might, you know, be better motivated by guilt than others. Uh, then we had self-efficacy. Mm, um, I remember. And yeah, yeah role of scientists. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, well, these are all three great questions. Um, I'll answer based on evidence from studies of creativity and positive psychology first. Um, lots of studies under which people get problems to solve that require creative thinking to solve them. And you can measure their level of creativity by measuring how many suggestions of possible solutions they come up with. So people are then showed a horror movie or a catastrophe movie, and then immediately afterwards given a task to solve. The other condition is that they're shown a comedy and then a neutral film, just a documentary, a boring documentary. Now, this shows a very clear distinction about how many suggestions for solutions do people come up with on the same task solving. And it shows that the people who have the comedy or the positive movie come up with significantly more than those who have seen the catastrophe movie. Uh, Or or sometimes by orders of magnitude. So... um, the, this research can be summarized into a rule of thumb showing that if you have a three to one ratio of, let's say, positive to catastrophic consequences or framings, then you get the optimum response on their cre- people's creativity and engagement. Um, if you have zero catastrophe and zero seriousness, it's all happy, funny, Pollyanna, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really work. So I'm not saying scientists should kind of shut up and not talk about these fundamental problems we have. So I'm saying we have to shift the balance from 80% catastrophe and less than 5% opportunity to 75% opportunity and 25% catastrophe. So, and this is not just what you think, but actually what people hear. That's the problem. So you have to put yourself in the, in the audience's question. What do people hear? I can believe I speak a lot about solutions, but what people heard was, was, was uh, catastrophe because we're somewhat allergic to it. And that, that's the com- really communication. So um, that's the rule of thumb. Um, and I hope people can take that away. It's, I think I find it very useful. And I think there are some references in my book about where this comes from. Um, second, if not, please email me and I'll give you that. Self-efficacy. Thanks for raising that up. Uh, and as you can see, um, from the figures I showed you, the graph showing that, are we, do you have belief in our collective efficacy to solve the climate problem? And at least in the USA, it's very low. Unfortunately, we don't have very good internationally uh, comparable survey results. It's part of the problem that every country, researchers have been doing their own climate psychology surveys and not using standards. And we don't have good time series. So it's really a patchwork. I've been spending lots and lots of time reading different surveys, and they never match completely. So what I would love to see is for SEI to do some survey on the Swedish population that could be correlated with international surveys as to how do you perceive the collective efficacy of our societies to solve the climate problem. And then, working from self-efficacy, you could heighten that. Uh, Actually, I think... Climate scientist communicators have been doing a disservice to self-efficacy by overemphasizing indicators such as PPMs in the atmosphere of CO2 and uh, the sea level rise per in, in inches per decade, because all these kind of signals kill the feeling of self-efficacy. 
So how do we shift the majority of our signaling into a mode where people can see that actually, oh, we are turning. We are doing better this year than we did previous year. My company is turning around. Suddenly we're in, so I found some incredibly interesting results studying companies. So like Telenor in Norway, they have been doing their fair share and even more uh, in turning around their economy. And I think Sweden in particular is a fantastic case because according to studies I've seen, uh, the numbers I've been studying since 2000, Sweden as a country has had a genuine green growth with more than 5% improvements in carbon productivity per year. Uh, and I think Stockholm would probably be at the top of that as well, even though I haven't seen proper figures. So these kind of stories about community um, aggregation, uh, community action, and then getting research feedback on the, the impacts we're having locally, these would play back and strengthen the feeling of self-efficacy. And I think, as you're pointing out, strengthening the feeling of self-efficacy is crucial to keeping a long-term engagement with climate change. And climate scientists have been inadvertently killing it. That's my provocative mm. uh, statement. I'm not saying that they wanted to do it, but it's a, become a by-effect of the way we've been communicating and structuring the research. And then finally, the role of scientists. Thank you so much. Um, that's really core to my heart. And um, um, we must recognize and respect all scientists that do their work uh, and produce the fantastic academic high level quality research they do and not wanting to take a societal role. Uh, so I'm not criticizing scientists for not going beyond their role. However, those who feel called for it should be helped to find ways to communicate it. And I think one of the best examples I've seen is the website, Is This How You Feel? You can Google it if you want. Is this how you feel? This is, this is how I feel. And um, I think I have it somewhere here. Oh. Oh, well, I, 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 I skipped the slide for short brevity. There we go. Is this how you feel? Weebly.com. And what is this? It gives an opportunity because, you know, natural scientists are trained not to get into emotion, not to get into storytelling, not to be too personal. And it's part of their... PhD training, and that's what you get. So it's quite logical. But if you want to have an impact as a climate communicator, you have to be emotional. You have to have a pathos. You have to have an ethos, somebody that you can relate to, and in addition to all your logos, which you already have. So um, they are invited to writing letters, not on the machine, but on pen. So about how you feel about your research into climate science. And I think it's, it's non-defensive, it's heartwarming, it's despairing, it opens up for so much more of the whole human being. And suddenly the audience can relate to this scientist as a personal human being who you can feel is rare and not just an egghead behind a white lab coat. Um, but of course, doing that makes you vulnerable. And I'm, I'm not demanding that of any scientist, but I hope more will do so. And I've written a book about it, actually, together with Jürgen Randers and a few prominent scientists. It's called Science-Based Activism. Um, so it's uh, some of the leading climate researchers and climate activists, uh, people in the world, uh, like um, um, ooh, 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 our friend from MIT um, behind the climate. Yeah, OK. And, and of course, sorry? Yeah. Ah, oh, sorry. My head is somewhere else right now. So um, if, if scientists could frame and add a personal narrative, why do people, why do a scientist care about this um, ecosystem in a Svalbard fjord? Why do you feel for the way a glacier is moving? Why do you engage in the type of algae pollution that is coming up? Uh, what's your personal relationship to the ocean? These kind of things would make it more accessible for people in general. And I really hope uh, scientists will be courageous and share uh, this personal story in addition to their to their data. Well, I don't know if that's what. Yeah. Good to hear. Uh.
Um, I've got a couple of questions here um, online from people who are watching the, the webcast. Um, and the, the first one, I will read it out, but I also want to slightly add to it um, so that we actually take a step forward from the answer you've just given to Orsa's question. But the question here is, how do we encourage scientists? How do we encourage scientists and their institutions to communicate messages in ways other than papers? Mm. And I want to throw that even broader to say, what are the structural problems that stand in the way of using those five enablers that you described to us so in a in a an academic context that's mm. something to do with you know the fact that papers are seen as the gold standard that that's part of building your academic career there's mm. all this stuff around as you said the scientific method prioritizing logos over anything else pathos and and ethos as well mm. but that the, you could also throw that out into the media you know, mm. What are the structural problems in the media that means that eighty percent of of the of the messages are doom messages? So that's that's my that, that's the question. We'll come to the second one in a moment. Was there two or one questions? <laughs> um, yeah, many I'm quite questions sure. Probably. Many questions, yeah. probably. Okay. Um, first, um, a scientist is very rarely acknowledged by his peers if he does um, personal or media engagement. Um, most, quite often. Um, you get ridiculed because it's oversimplification and then you feel bad about it yourself because a journalist and the maybe you know the journalist but even the, the desk is kind of giving you a title or changing it in a way that makes you feel that this is not my research so and then on the on the positive side there are hardly any um, benefits or incentives for scientists to really engage uh, so there's this extreme disbalance in academia in terms of um, you get no benefit from climate communication at all. Actually, um, one leading climate communicator in, in Norway, um, uh, oh, sorry, my brain, this beautiful blonde lady from uh, Bjarknes, West Coast, um, she, oh, the name will come. Um, she has done a lot of climate outreach and she shares personal stories. For instance, you know, when the climate temperature goes up in waves like this, each time it lift flattens, then climate scientists, uh, sorry, uh, climate um, um, uh, contrarians say that the climate change has stopped. And uh, as he said, climate has been cooling every time since uh, I, grew, I grew up and she gives personal story about how old was she when the first time you had this and then the second time and the third time and you can relate to her whole growth and then always is going down if you should listen to these people and the way she tells it is just beautiful and you laugh and, and you feel and she tends to speak about her kid and, and she, she makes it in a beautiful way but when she got home and there was a change of leadership at the institute um, she was confronted with um, I don't see your production is keeping up. Uh, where uh, this all this time on communicating, uh, I think you have to re revise it because we're not, you know, delivering here. So her boss actually reprimanded her for doing climate outreach uh, to a large extent, uh, even if she's probably the most effective climate communicator in Norway. Um, so. Structural issues, why don't we have, like in, like in business, you have these dual career ways. You don't have to become a manager to manage people. If you're a good engineer or a good scientist, you could have an academic or engineering um, uh, career stage. And why can't we have a dual system in, without an academia as well? So you get kind of credited for your, actually your communications work outside of publishing articles. So that was one reflection I had. Um, what was your other idea? In the media, yeah. Remember, guys, journalists are busy, they are whipped around, they're underpaid, and they always have bad time. So, I have a short time. So, if you want to speak with a journalist, you have to be very, very clear on your framing up front. So, because they will, if you inadvertently happen to use a catastrophe framing, they will latch onto it because they're, don't, they're lazy and don't have time. So, being very aware of your framing from the first statement you give to a, a journalist is kind of um, key. So, 
I think there's this wonderful book, you might have heard of it, he's better than me, and in making scientists communicate better. It's called Olson, uh, it's called Don't Be Such a Scientist. If you haven't heard about it, check it up. The book is called Don't Be Such a Scientist. And, and uh, his, I think his advice and his work in terms of video and filming is pretty inspiring. So that was a few associations, top of my head. Yeah, that's very helpful, Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, Randy Olson also appears in some of our trainings that we oh, do here. Oh, wonderful. So, you have uh, him here. Right, cool. Uh, I didn't know. Well, no, not personally, but his his ideas and his work, his methods. Hmm. So I've got, gosh, there are more questions coming in here, <laughs> and there are hands going up in the room, okay? So get ready now. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, and I think this is asking perhaps for some, you know, some references or some research you could refer to. Who communicates climate change most effectively? Is it the scientists, the politicians, business, civil society? What's the evidence? Uh, next, how useful uh, are the dream that the engagement and opportunities you're talking about? Isn't there a danger we're peddling another kind of denial? And then Greg has a question and Anna has a question. Yes, something in your um, one of the illustration made me uh, jump up a lot, actually, which is the last one when you summarise that identity and politics actually have nothing to do with climate science. Uh, also, and I have done a lot of work on values, mm. and um, if you're looking at the kind of behaviour we want to we want to change, we can definitely point out to certain types of behaviour and certain types of political actions that are not uh, in any type, of shape, or form. Uh, commensurable with climate action and, and, and radical emission reductions. Um, so, again, I would like to know how you reflect on this as a communicator that you have to take into values that not, might not be reconcilable with the type of, of emission reductions you would like to see. Hmm. Uh, so, my question is how do you see? Uh, media's role in helping us getting this message out, the good message. Because it's like built in in media's logic is that they uh, sell bad news. I mean, that's their business idea. And we sort of need them to get the message out. So I wonder how you look upon their sort of future role. Okay. Wow, big questions. Yeah. Um, First, who communicates uh, most effectively? And that, of course, depends on the audience. Who, are you, who, who is it you want to reach? Uh, so you, I, I guess it's impossible to do that universally. But I have some, um, some um, favorite cases uh, of people going in new directions. And you might have heard about Sustainia 100. Uh, so if you don't know, check them up. Sustainia 100. Each year they launch uh, a best 100 solutions within 10 sectors of the economy. And they only speak of solutions, and they do so in a brilliant way, and they use top politicians and names such as Arnold Schwarzenegger and others to kind of bring fame and, and um, disseminating knowledge on the best practices of the world. So Sustainia 100, I think that is, they are representing part of the future of climate communications. Also, I like the work that is being done by DNVGL, uh, the, the Veritas, and they have a global opportunity report. So they take the 10 major risks and then they identify all the opportunities relating to the men, 10 major risks. And then they collaborate with scientists and com companies and NGOs and politicians on how do we capitalize on all the opportunities in, inherent in all the risks. So these are two great examples. I also like the way uh, the climate group work in uh, the UK. If you don't know them, please check them out. Also, I love the work done by greenbiz.com in the US. So also, I like the work done by uh, the Blue Economy Initiative, uh, Ginter Pauli, uh, and the work done at the Wuppertal Institute. So these are kind of mingling of science with commercial initiatives that um, have a credibility when it comes to communicating climate in an opportunity-framed way. But I'm not a judge. Um, actually, I was a judge. I was invited by the MIT on one of their last, um, last uh, competitions. So we had 64 project ideas competing for the prize in the best way of communicating climate behavior change. 
And I will give you the winner. Look it up. It's called uh, hashtag dare tomorrow. Hashtag dare tomorrow. So that was not just me. It was a team of six judges. And we picked that as the best uh, initiative within the MIT competition. Hashtag dare tomorrow. So um, the question, dream. If we are selling the dream, are we then just peddling uh, increased uh, denialism uh, by making people feel cozy and positive and uh, getting into some kind of bubble? Um, and of course, if you sell the dream in a way that becomes fundamentalistic and um, in opposition to critical discourse, then we're in deep shit. So that's why I'm currently reading a very critical book on green growth. There we go. Ideology, political economy, and, and the alternatives. So they're take they're saying this this thing that SEI is involved in, the new climate economy report and the green economy, it's all crap. Uh, it's just uh, it's impossible. It's not going to happen. And then I'm going through all the arguments. I'm making sure. If I'm going to continue to speak about green growth as a way out of this solution, what answers do I have to these fantastic, well-formulated, academic, sharp questions? And if I can't answer them, I can't be genuine when I speak about the dream. But if I can be, then I can still go on speaking about that dream because I find it credible. So my work now, after writing this book, <laughs> is to write a new book on green growth where I'm going to explain why these guys are too narrow in their imagination. Why they're not imaginative enough. They're seeing all the obstacles, but they're not seeing the possible solutions. And I'm going to paint a coherent, critical picture. And I hope I'm going to annoy the <laughs> eco-fundamentalists who say that green growth is just a, 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 a mirage, just something that the politicians are peddling to make people feel good and get votes. And then I'm going to challenge them into countering my arguments for why it's, it's plausible and why it can happen. So that's my personal response to that. Um, if you really, if you, if, let's say, there's this thing about storytelling. It's kind of profound. If you tell a story and you don't really believe it yourself, then the story takes its revenge on you. Because stories are bigger than us. Stories have intelligences that connect with other stories, ideas, networks of ideas. And if you don't have a living relationship to the story you're telling, the audience somehow picks up on that. And then it undermines your own position. So when you tell a story, be true to the story and be true to yourself. That's, that's mine. And if you do that and still can talk about the dream, um, I see no problem with it. Also, I have a, my last chapter in my book speaks about different types of hope kind of Pollyanna, illusory hope, um, heroic hope, stoic hope, and a grounded hope. So I could also speak about that. But I think there are different ways of being hopeful and dreamy. Um, and then first, lastly, and how do we speak to the media? I think we should study the masters. What did Steve Jobs do? How did he make the entire world write about the opportunities of Apple without them paying a dollar in advertising. How does Elon Musk communicate in a way that makes the media rush and give Tesla billions and billions and billions of dollars in free uh, media attention? So how can we, because you know, if you just take an article and go out to the journalist and tell it, they have to find their own framing on it. But if you're creative and imaginative, why can't we using charisma, storytelling, framing, which we know works, come up with ways of hooking the journalist into writing an interesting story and just, just repeating the boring, good old apocalypse thing. So uh, that's my challenge. And I think Sustainia, for instance, are pretty good at it and other, and the other examples I've mentioned. So that's a few uh, reflections from my side. That's it? Yeah.
Thank you very, very much, yeah. Chris, that was fantastic. I, I just, in my wrap-up, I'd say, uh, I, I was also rather as provoked at the, moment, what the point that you said, you know, climate science has got nothing to do with politics, and I, I think I understand what you mean by that, but uh, I want to, to just give you a, a little bit of a reflection. When I've been speaking to the, the Swedish government for, for a long time about how they communicate what their policies are on climate change, and indeed their responsibilities to, to sort of talk about climate science, um, they uh, have finally finally got the message uh, a little bit of what you've been uh, presenting to us and before COP21 came up with some key messages and what I was very struck by was the fact that their key message in its first two sentences did not contain the words climate change mm. and they talked about you know opportunities mm -hmm. and jobs uh, and growth mm. um, and I think that the, it's quite clear that politics and climate science do go hand in hand and, and the connection is is the sort of work that you've been doing so we're we're very grateful that you've come and, and talked to us today and we have a small uh, thank you token of appreciation so mm -hmm. thank you very much everybody Wow. Mighty oak. Yes. I love the Swedish oaks. <laughs> I really do. I you know I have deep, deep connections with actually growing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Anybody want to continue? I have some I have some books also if anybody wants to. Have a copy. Yeah.